Well, good morning, everyone. It's really good to be back with you this morning as we come together to finish up this series on worship. We're calling this one Worship, Living in the Awe of God. And we've had a chance to look at worship over these past few weeks from several different angles, right? We began under our series by understanding that we are being called to be all in in our worship. Worship God with the totality of our being, our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. And then we talked about worship as a response to the love and the grace and the mercy that we have received from God by loving others. Using the story of the Good Samaritan, we discovered that the, that the fact that we are able to worship God and through our loving actions toward other people. We love because Jesus loved us first. So our natural response then is to love others. And this too is an act of worship, living in the awe of God. In our third week on worship, it involved our attitudes and our thoughts and our behaviors around money and giving. Knowing that our giving, our our bringing an offering is an act of worship. In point of fact, this was this giving of offerings that we see was the first act of worship that is recorded in the Bible. So giving has been a part of worship since the beginning of time. Our offering time is an act of worship, as is everything that we do in the church service. And so this really brings us to the heart of the issue. What is worship, and, and what is God intending for it to be? Now, three weeks ago, we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Right? And today we're going to look at another story involving another Samaritan. So who were the Samaritans anyway? Well, Jesus' ministry had taken him into Samaria en route to Galilee. Now the history of the Samaritans, that dates back all the way to the Assyrian Empire coming into the northern kingdom of Israel in approximately 721 B.C. As a result, they exiled a great number of Hebrew people to different countries while at the same time importing a bunch of Assyrians into Israel. And as those people integrated into Israel, they intermarried with the Hebrew people. As a result, Samaritans. The Samaritan people were born. And then the Babylonians invaded in approximately 600 B.C. and the reign of the Assyrians ended. So this allowed many Hebrew people to begin to return to the northern kingdom during the reign of Artaxerxes. There was a cupbearer to the king named Nehemiah, and he decided to return to Jerusalem and repair the temple walls. And after his arrival, he attempted to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, but he was opposed by the people living there, who were Samaritans. So amidst a bunch of different struggles and conflicts that continued for centuries, and it grew quite intense around the time of Jesus. So when Jesus comes to Samaria, there is a lot of anger and hate and, and, and conflict. And he stops at this well that was dug by the Hebrew patriarch Jacob, as in Abraham, Isaac, and you know, Jacob and Esau, that Jacob, okay? So Jesus rests while some of his disciples, they head into town to buy some supplies. And this leads us right into our text for today, our story for today. So let's pray, and then we'll get into our text. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to learn about worship. Lord, would you open up our hearts and our minds and, and spirit to truly understand the awe and the power of worship. Amen. Well, if you're able, please stand for the reading of Scripture. Today's passage comes from the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 24. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans, and she said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if if you only knew the gift God has for you, And who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But, sir, (laughs) you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? 
And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Um, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you're not even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly have spoken the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet, so tell me why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while the Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one who you worship. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Word of the Lord. You may be seated. So while, this, uh, while, while he's waiting, Jesus, the Samaritan woman approaches Jesus in, in, in seeking water, right? And this story is filled with all types of imagery that speaks to the importance of worship. Perhaps the most important piece to this conversation relates to Jesus' promise of living water. According to Merrill Tenney, he wrote a really big fat commentary on the Gospel of John. Anyway, this is what he writes. The woman heard his words but missed the meaning. Living water meant to her a fresh spring of water such as the well supplied. She could not understand how he could provide this water without having any means of drawing it from the well. Her comment was appropriate to the one whose comprehension was tied only to the earthly and the material. For the well, even today, is over 75 feet deep and it's probably been filled in over over the years with a lot of debris. So the woman came looking for a water that would sustain her for a period of time, but Jesus wanted to supply her with water that would never leave her lacking. Do you get it? We are talking about water, but we're talking about, you know, H2O, real water, right? Rather than water as a metaphor for life, life giving water for our souls, given to us by God, which therefore elicits a response from us. And what did we talk about as the appropriate response to God? Worship, right? Worship. We are kind of built for worship. I have a little video I want you to see. When it says in the Old Testament, worship no other gods than me, the implication I offer is that we are a species that worships, and if you do not access the divine, you will worship the mundial, you will worship the profane. You will worship your own identity. You will worship your belongings. You will worship the template laying before you by a culture that wants you, not wants you, but gets you distracted and relatively dumb. Russell Brandt, the controversial person, no doubt, with widely varying views on a lot of different topics, but he's keyed in on something interesting in that little clip. You see, God created us, male and female. He created us to worship him. Worship, then, is in our DNA. Russell is right in that assessment. And if we we tend to worship things, if you're a socialist, like truly a socialist, then religion, the opiate of the masses, as Karl Marx once said, is replaced by worship for the state or the government. That is your source of worship and benevolence. If you're a narcissist, well, then you worship yourself. If you're a Samaritan, you are concerned with where you worship over and against where the Jews or the Israelites worshiped in Jerusalem. 
And in this conversation with the woman, Jesus speaks very honestly about her personal situation, and he calls her to accept that her life impacts her ability to worship. Her initial request of living water creates this bridge that Jesus can use to draw her across and speak to her heart about what is really needed in her life, and that's transformation. You see, being a creature designed to worship, she worshiped love or lust or sex. She was a promiscuous woman. Jesus is at this well in the very heat of the day, long after the other women, you know, the upstanding good women, had come and drawn water from the well. This woman has to come at off times so that she will not be harassed for being a homewrecker. If you do not access the divine, Brand said, you will worship the mundial. You will worship the profane. That was the situation of the woman. She had worshipped the profane and had given her heart to many different men. And so she begins to talk about where we worship. She's kind of like changing the subject, right? On Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem? But Jesus instructors, instructs her, it's not about where, it's about how. For this woman, she had an impoverished and interpretation of the law. It's both fueled by and impaired by her understanding of what God expected in worship. The Samaritans, they founded their belief on the historic fact that when Moses had instructed the people concerning entering into the promised land, that they, he commanded them to set up an altar on Mount Ebal, and that the tribe should be divided in half, half of them on Ebal and half of them on Gerizim. And as the Levites read through the law, the people responded verbally. Those on Gerizim pronounced the blessings of God, and those on Ebal pronounced the curses of God for sin. And the Jews held that Solomon had been commissioned to build the temple in Jerusalem, and so that should be the center of worship. It should be located there. And there was this endless controversy, and Jesus did not allow himself to get drawn into this futile discussion, right? This dialogue, it sets the stage for Jesus' key teaching about worship. According to Jesus, God's primary concern with worshiper is the intent of our hearts, not the location of our bodies. In fact, Jesus leaves this woman dumbfounded when he proclaims, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship is about our hearts. The passage in the New Testament is the densest cluster of this form of the word worship in our story this morning. In John chapter 4, verses um, 20 through 24, Jesus, the woman of the well, uses a word, a verb for worship. In Greek, it's uh, proskuneo, and it occurs nine times in five verses. Nine times. As the woman brings up this long-standing debate between the Jews and the Samaritans over the location of true worship, Mount Gerizim or Mount Zion in Jerusalem, Jesus' decisive reply is to refer her to a new era that he is inaugurating, for which the specific location of worship is irrelevant. Rather, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? What does in spirit and truth mean? In Greek, it's pneumate kai aletheia, worship in truth. It can be translated in spirit and in truth, and it can be taken to refer to two separate qualities, right? From the heart rather than mere ritual, and genuine or true and sincere rather than a sham or a fake, both as a result of divine revelation. But it can also be handled as, a, as, a, as two things that mean one, right? The, the technical, like grammatical thing would be a pair of related nouns joined by a con conjunction to refer to a single concept comprised of two words so that the phrase would mean in the true spirit. Jesus' point then is, that spirit-guided worship of God is what God desires. Not traveling to a specific location to be especially close to God, neither in a temple or a church building, none of that is required. What is required is the people, the assembly of God, who gather together become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God is spirit, and he lives inside of us. So the overall lesson about worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth is that worship of God 
is not to be confined to some single geographical location like it was in the Old Testament. With the coming of Christ, there, the separation between Jew and Gentile is no longer relevant, nor was the temple as the locus of worship. With the coming of Christ, all of God's children gained equal access to God through him, through Jesus. So worship becomes a matter of our hearts, not external actions. And it's directed by truth rather than ceremony. Richard Foster, he wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline, The Path to Spiritual Growth. It's really old, but it's a great book. Anyways, in it he writes this, worship is our response to the overtures of love from the heart of the Father. Its central reality is found in spirit and truth. It is kindled within us only when the Spirit of God touches our human spirit. Well, that brings up some questions, right? What, what about our services? What about our traditions, our liturgy, our music style, the songs we sing? Well, Foster says something about that too. He says this, forms and ritual do not produce worship nor does the disuse of forms and rituals. So we can use all of the right techniques and all of the right methods and have the best possible liturgy, he says, but we, we have not worshiped the Lord until spirit touches spirit. Spirit touches spirit. This is not to diminish the value of spiritual disciplines, but it does put them in our proper perspective. Jesus' introduction to the woman about admitting her need, being honest with her about her situation, and accepting God's gift and her willingness to tell others uh, all about it points to what God expects for us when it comes to worship. If we are to worship God as God intends, then we must be willing to discipline ourselves to hear from God. You know, all of this so far has been really technical, right? Right? As we've gone deep, we talked about Greek and stuff, about this spirit and truth. So I'm going to tell you a story. It's real. It happened. When I was in Omaha, we had this uh, winter fest, I think it's called. It, it's where Christian bands come, 10 bands for 10 bucks, right? And the promoters of the concert, they sold a lot of those $10 tickets, for an 8,500-seat arena, and 28,000 people showed up. Okay, so that doesn't fit. And so they let us all in, and those of us lucky to get in were entertained by a great concert. In the meantime, the rest of the people who couldn't get in didn't leave. They just stood there in the parking lot. Now, you remember I said this is called what? Winterfest. Omaha, Nebraska, okay? So one of the performers, his name is Brandon Heath, and forever, this guy's my hero. So there's about, I don't know, 15,000 people or so standing outside the arena in the cold. It's starting to snow. But they're out there, and they're praying, and they're raising their hands, and they're worshiping. And Brandon Heath goes out there with one of those five-gallon Home Depot buckets, those orange things, you know? And he flips it upside down and he gets up on the bucket with his guitar and he just starts playing songs. He started by playing one of his songs. But that wasn't, I mean, the people were like, yay, you know. But, but he switched right after that first song to just worship songs that people probably know from church. And what happened was worship in spirit and truth. Because Brandon Heath and 15,000 people in a parking lot in Omaha, Nebraska in the snow sang so loud that we could hear them over the band on the inside. Spirit, touching spirit. That's what this is about. So how do we do this? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Moses sets down for the Israelites how they are to love God, right? We've looked at this several times during our our passage or or during our series here. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. Our worship of God is directed by our love for him. 
as we love, so we worship. Because this idea of might in Hebrew indicates totality. Jesus expands the expression in his, in his gospel to include mind and strength. And so the worship of God in spirit and truth necessarily involves loving him with our whole heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, which a few weeks ago we called being all in in our worship. So the worship must be in spirit, that is, engaging the whole heart. Unless there's a real passion for God, there's no worship in the spirit. At the same time, our worship must be in truth, right? That is properly informed. Unless we have a knowledge of God that we worship, there's no worship in truth. Both are necessary for God-honoring worship. Spirit without truth leads to some kind of a shallow emotional experience. It could be compared to kind of like a high, right? Right? And as soon as the emotion is over and the fervor cools, right, the worship ends. But truth without spirit can result in this dry, passionless encounter that can easily lead to a form of joyless legalism. So it's best when there's a combination of both aspects of worship, which results in a joyous appreciation of God informed by Scripture. And the more we know about God, the more we appreciate him. And the more that we appreciate him, the deeper is our worship. And the deeper is our worship, the more God is glorified. Amen? The melding of spirit and truth in worship is summed up well by Jonathan Edwards, the 18th century American pastor and theologian and Presbyterian. He said, I should think myself in the way of my duty to raise the affections or the emotions of my hearers as high as I possibly can, provided that they are affected with nothing but truth. Edwards, you see, recognized that truth and only truth can properly influence the emotions in a way that brings honor to God, the truth of God being of infinite value and worthy of our passion and worship. So I'm going to close now with a couple of practical steps maybe for implementing this kind of worship, worship in spirit and truth. And I'd like to talk to you about three different ways that we can worship in spirit and truth, whether you're on your own or you're attending a church service. It is, the first one is this ancient scripture reading technique called Lectio Divina. It's an ancient practice of holy reading. As people attempt to experience a more connected God or, or a, a more connection with God in our worship, Lectio Divina can be quite fruitful. So you begin... I'm going to give it down. You can Google this on the internet. There's lots of, you know, goes lots of instructions. But basically, you start with finding a place where it's quiet, where there's not very many distractions for the reading of your passage. And then you just simply sit there and you pray and you open yourself up to God and you ask him to give you the experience to, to speak to you through the text. Those are the first two, 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 two steps of this, by the way, um, that you prepare yourself to read the word. And as you're doing so, you're kind of shutting out the distractions and the noise of life that keep you from listening to the still, small voice of God. So you read that passage for the first time. You read it slowly, allowing the words to sink into your heart and your mind. And next, you pick a word or a phrase from the passage and you meditate on it. This is in the Latin called meditatio, on the word or the phrase from the passage. You just sit and you think about it allowing it to sink deeper into your heart and mind. And in this step, we are savoring the word of God. And we talk to God. Next step. This is called a ratio, right? This is a time of prayer. You just talk to God about how you feel about that word or that phrase that you've been meditating on. And then spend a little bit of time quietly listening, maybe praying to God to reveal to your mind a new insight or a new truth. This step is called contemplatio. It is the step where you just sit and you rest with God. You try to quiet your mind and shut out the distractions and listen to him, feel him, interact with him. It's a discipline of silence. It could take some time, depending on how noisy your self-talk is, you know, how many random weird thoughts run through your mind during that time. Okay? So that's, that's one way you can worship in spirit and truth. Another way is you can reflect on the person of God. Sometimes the best way to set your mind to worship is to just focus on the person of God. Focus on Jesus. 
When we consider the person of Jesus, we're drawn into what it means to be able to worship him. Hillsong wrote a song called What a Beautiful Name to celebrate Jesus and his work to bring redemption. In the song, Brooke Ligertwood says that she was contemplating how Jesus is God in creation revealed. That's the truth of the song, right? This is where our hearts must go to see and experience the glory of Christ as we look out at, at creation. We can worship him in, wor- in spirit and truth. A third way is to self-examine. If we are to worship God in spirit and truth, then we must be willing to examine ourselves while considering his majesty. Sometimes worship will be a time of celebration and joy and mystery. Other times it will be a time of repentance and sadness, maybe even loss. However, when we worship God in spirit and truth, we are inviting God to examine us while trusting him to care for us when we're most vulnerable. Like the woman at the well, her sins laid bare by Jesus Christ. But it was a moment of worship for her, right? So if we're in a worship service with other believers and we don't like the music, if there's something about the service or the people on stage that is bothering you, you need to ask yourself, why? Why should this bother me? Why am I allowing myself to miss my spirit touching God's spirit? Because that interaction of the worship between the creator and the created can take place in any kind of service, not just the ones that express worship the way we prefer it. So open up yourselves to experience God and his worship and however he wants you to experience that. Allowing your preferences to get in the way of worship, that's on us. That's not on the people up here. That's on you. That's on us if we do that. Because God is here And he is ready to touch our spirits, ready to feed our souls in worship. But if we get hung up on our preferences, then we disconnect ourselves from worship. Then we're worshiping back on Mount Gerizim instead of in the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is inside of us. Dependence on God and the Holy Spirit is true worship. It is corporate worship. The Holy Spirit will guide us into worship when we are humble when we're honest, when we're intentional about it. Worshiping God from our hearts and doing so with others as they learn to worship will help us find a deeper understanding of how we're all built. Because Russell Brand is right. We are a species that has been made to worship, but we must learn and commit to worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Letting his spirit touch our spirits. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this series on worship. It's been good. It's been good to get to know what it is that you want from us in our worship, Lord. And it is a true thing to know that we will worship no matter what. But what we worship, Lord, that's on us. Whether we come and we worship ourselves, whether we come and we worship the profane, or whether we come and we worship our preferences, Lord, all of that is on us. But when we open up our hearts and we allow our spirit to be touched by your spirit, Lord, that is worship in spirit and truth. That is what you want communion, an everlasting connection between you and us, between us and you. And whether, Lord, we find that worship in spirit and truth in the quiet of our reading, in the opening up of our hearts in prayer, in the contemplation of the qualities of who you are, or when we gather and we sing songs to you. Let us be all in with everything that we are. Let us come together 
And when we come together, it becomes its own thing. As all of us collectively provide that space to encounter your Holy Spirit and to worship in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen.